I took my first trip to Germany in 1995. I was living in Moscow in those days, and at that time, thousands of Jewish people were moving to Germany from the former USSR. So I went to Germany to discover how German pastors felt about this wave of Jewish repatriation. One night I spoke with a pastor whom I'll call Hartmut. He clearly loved my people, but he told me something very distressing. He said, because of the Holocaust, we Germans can't tell Jewish people about the Lord. What should you do instead, I asked. We should love the Jewish people, he said. We should help them wherever we can. But when it comes to Jesus, we should be silent. Silent, I said. Yes, he said, silent. I changed the subject and we talked about other things. And then after a few minutes, I said, Hartmut, there were genuine Christians in Germany during the war, weren't there? Yes, of course, he said. He was old enough to remember those days as a child. So, what would you say was the sin of the believing church during the Third Reich? Without pausing even a fraction of a second to think, he answered, we were silent. And then his face froze as though he'd been struck by the echo of his own words. You were silent, I said, and people died. There are Christians who say that it isn't necessary to tell the gospel message to the Jewish people or to anyone else for that matter. You don't have to declare the gospel, they say. You just have to demonstrate the gospel through your acts of kindness and your silent love. Your Christian love and your lifestyle are much more powerful testimonies than empty words. Well, Christians who make this claim have failed to grasp a basic truth about the very nature of the gospel itself. The gospel is not a lifestyle that we live. The gospel is a message that we must explain. You could say that there are two types of messages in the world. There are conduct-driven messages and there are content-driven messages. Let me give you an example of each, of each kind. Love is a conduct-driven message. Children understand that they're loved by their parents long before they understand words or concepts like love. They know that they're loved simply by the way that their parents relate to them, by their parents' conduct. And later on, words help them understand the concept of love more fully. But initially, they don't understand that they're loved from words. They understand that they're loved by their parents' conduct. That's a conduct-driven message. Now, let me give you an example of a content-driven message. Suppose I needed to fly from Oslo to Budapest tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock on Wizz Air Flight 456. Suppose I have to be checked in at the gate no longer than 40 minutes before the flight leaves. And just for the sake of drama, let's say that my life depends on me being on that particular flight. In other words, if I miss the flight, I die. Tell me, how are you going to get me onto that flight? Can you love me onto that flight? Can you communicate what I need to know about the date, the time, the flight number by your lifestyle or by the way that you relate to me? No. The only way you'll get me on the plane is by explaining to me the details of the flight, the content. The gospel is a content-driven message. And what's the content that my people and all people need to know, understand, and trust? Simply this. Our sins have separated us from God. We're cut off from the author of life, and as a result, our lives are pointless and our endeavors are futile. We're trapped by our sinful behavior so that even if we want to change, we can't. And when we die, we enter eternity completely bereft of any presence of God, separated from Him forever. We need to be rescued from the penalty that our sins deserve, God's eternal judgment, and we need to be rescued from the power that sin exercises over our daily lives. Jesus is our rescuer. That's the good news. 
When he died, he took upon himself the eternal judgment of God that we deserve. Then he rose from the dead so that we can repent and ask him to forgive us for the suffering that our sins caused him to endure. And when we repent, he not only forgives us and restores us to a correct relationship with the Father, he gives us his Holy Spirit who empowers us to live godly lives instead of lives enslaved to sin. That's the gospel message that all people, including my people, need to hear. They need to grasp it. They need to trust it. It's a message of content, not conduct. But isn't there a relationship between the content that we declare with our lips and and the conduct that we demonstrate with our lives? Yes, of course. God may use our conduct to capture people's attention and to cause them to inquire about the message, just as God used the burning bush to capture Moses' attention and cause him to say, I must turn aside and see why the bush is not burned up. But once Moses was standing before this miraculous sign, God explained what he wanted Moses to do. Without the explanation, the purpose for the sign had no meaning. So God may use our conduct as something of a sign to capture people's attention, to turn aside, to see, to inquire. God may also use our conduct to confirm that the conduct we declare is true. But our conduct is not the content. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Messiah. God doesn't just act. God explains. Without his explanation, his conduct remains a mystery that we can easily misunderstand. Is it right and good for Christians to demonstrate the love of God to their Jewish friends? Absolutely. Help my people. Support our causes. Cry out against anti-Semitism wherever it's found, whether in the political arena or in the church. But if you think that it's enough merely to demonstrate a silent love for my people, and live godly lives in front of them, then you're mistaken. Oftentimes, we misinterpret your silent love as sorrow for centuries of Christian misconduct. We may misinterpret your silent godly conduct as an expression of your desire to be forgiven by us. We don't interpret your conduct as a testimony of our need to be forgiven by God. Remember, Some Jewish people tragically and mistakenly believe that Jesus and his gospel are responsible for all the atrocities that we've endured for the past 2,000 years. Your silence merely reinforces that lie. We must not keep silent and let that lie persist. So love my people, uphold my people, help my people, but don't rest until the content of the gospel goes forth.